operation to help you. Thank you, Arthur. Nice to. I can't get projections until I can figure out which set of figures is correct. Also, when you were talking previously about the, the, your whole proposal, if we could get a copy of that. Sure. Down from what we uh, $5,000 increase is, um, okay. What is the percentage here? Yes. Hmm? Do you have the number there? If he calls in, do you want me to? I don't write up these topics. Uh, as I said, my job is just to get this stuff out. But we have to do some long-range planning. Long-range planning is very, very Yes, we need to go ahead and provide additional services. Just, you know, we have the people, there's talented the people down there, and we can get a hold of a lot of people, but just a matter of time. Well, if you'll take the responsibility of pulling the group together to be sure. Natural 163, a projected 168. It looks like... The concept of control in business and public organizations is often misunderstood. For most of us, the term control suggests authority, the specter of big brother, and the military phrase command and control. But this view of control is very misleading. In management, control means something quite different. It has less to do with giving employees orders than with gathering information that is, monitoring, measuring, and reporting business events in order to achieve objectives. Actually, the term control was originally used to refer to the accounting practice of verifying payments and accounts against a duplicate register. And this is very much the sense in which the word is used today by management executives and business theorists. To put it simply, the function of control in management is to keep the organization on the right track by checking performance against established standards. Most firms set up systems to organize control activities, systems that use monitoring equipment. Now, the function of these control systems is to compare plans with performance. That is, control systems provide feedback about the performance expectations outlined in management's original plan compared to the actual performance achieved by the organization. Now, just as there are many kinds of plans in management, there are many kinds of controls and control systems. These include financial controls, inventory controls, and quality controls. The purpose of each of these is to allow management to measure performance against the standards that have been set for the organization, standards that are based on the company's business plan. Of course, the ultimate goal of any control system is to serve the various plans and objectives of management. The major purpose of an effective control system is to produce behavior of the managers of the various parts of a company, uh, which is in some way consistent with and supportive of the overall goals of the company, and which lets the company achieve its uh, objectives. Uh, to do this, uh, a control system first has to be built around a plan. And if we're talking about a financial control system, it would have to be built around an effective financial plan. Uh, once we have in place a realistic and effective financial plan, then what a good control system can do is provide a form of early warning system. Uh, it can tell a company when performance is deviating from this plan and can trigger, on behalf of uh, the various elements of the company, countermeasures. Uh, it can cause people to take steps to try and correct whatever is going wrong. Uh, but for that to be possible, it's absolutely essential that there be in place first an effective and realistic plan. In the case of a financial control system, a financial plan. To assist in implementing the organization's plan, control systems are typically designed around three basic steps. Control systems establish standards, measure and compare performance against those standards, and take corrective action. For example, the sales plan for a particular firm 
might call for the sale of 500 reinforced concrete girders in the Southeast Sales Territory. The standard of 500 items to be sold by the end of the fiscal year is established for the sales force covering this territory. Feedback in the form of monthly sales reports reveals the rate at which sales are actually progressing over the year. If the rate of sales doesn't meet the established standard of 500 girders, then some form of corrective action is required. One course of action might be to assist the sales force by buying additional advertising or devising better marketing techniques. Another might be to alter pricing. Perhaps the price of girders can be lowered. But it's also possible that the standards established in the planning stage turned out to be unrealistic because of a downturn in the economy. Whatever the problem, the control system is designed to help correct it. Now, control systems have always been uh, based on the idea of feedback, namely that by measuring what we're actually achieving and comparing actual performance against planned or budgeting performance, we can establish whether there's any variance and either correct uh, the variance or reinforce uh, the action if the variance has been positive. What we've learned for many years now is that there's a second sort of feedback and that is that occasionally the plans were inadequate. We failed to predict uh, what was happening in the environment or we failed to predict how successful we would be and we have to change our plans. And uh, so that forms a second feedback loop of modifying the plans to fit the new circumstances, and a typical example of that is the revised budget. Revising budgets and altering plans in light of new experience is a common management activity. In the case of the 500 girders, for example, both lowering the cost and boosting sales productivity called for typical management decisions. And it was a single control device, a monthly sales report by territory, that highlighted the need for these decisions. Management theorists traditionally divide controls into three categories differentiated by the time frame within which they take place. The first category, preventative controls, establishes conditions that will make it difficult or impossible for deviations from the norm to occur. This type of control is in place before a system or process is activated in order to block activities that aren't desired. The next category of controls is called feed-forward controls. These are also future-directed in that they're designed to detect and anticipate deviations from standards at various points throughout the process. Corrections and adjustments can be made as the need arises. There are two kinds of feed-forward controls, diagnostic controls, and therapeutic controls. Diagnostic controls include such items as gauges, meters, warning lights, and alarms, devices which indicate something isn't right. Employee evaluation forms are also a method of measuring performance against standards in order to detect positive and negative deviations. Therapeutic controls not only detect deviations, but take corrective action. The governor that checks the speed of an automobile also throttles down the engine. A computerized checking system not only registers the overdraft when it occurs, but posts a debit to the account and prepares a letter and an envelope for mailing to the customer. The third class of controls are feedback controls, which focus on the end results of the process. The information derived isn't used for corrective action because the project has been completed. In this case, the purpose is to help prevent mistakes in the future. At the executive level, control systems are seen as mechanisms that bring information to the top. Typically, these systems are intended to provide information about activities that are considered critical to senior management but can't be observed personally or monitored by senior level managers. Within our company, we uh, have a very sophisticated, I think, uh, planning and control network. And it, uh, it begins actually with the uh, 
the basic planning process, which really starts with our corporate objective. And we, uh, we have decided and have, uh, we continue to update this, but we established goals for our, for our total company and in terms of the growth rates we want to achieve, in terms of the uh, return on investments we want to achieve, uh, the types of businesses we want to participate in, and the, the, uh, the types of services we want to provide. So you, you, so you first of all establish that as a, as a general corporate objective. And, and from that aspect, uh, you then break that objective down into the various uh, business strategies and objectives. And, uh, once that's communicated and, and, and well understood, the, uh, the planning is accomplished, and then you've got to decide how you're going to how you're going to measure uh, the performance uh, in all those business areas, in all those planning areas. And so, there are there are literally thousands of indices, you know, or goals, if you will, that we have established that we feel are sensitive to running our business. There are a variety of areas that need control. Uh, the first that comes to mind in a, in a business organization are financial controls. And we have a highly centralized system. We don't like financial surprises around here. Um, we have controllers, of course, in all of our subsidiaries, but they operate under guidelines that have been established by the control mechanism in the parent, that is to say in Times Mirror, uh, there are constant um, re-examinations of that system. Uh, these controllers get together from time to time, uh, and no controller dare operate outside of the guidelines. Another area that requires control is our legal situation. As you know, this has become an era of everybody suing everybody for any conceivable reason. And any large corporation is constantly involved with lawsuits of one sort or another. Here again, we have this at least, uh, if not centralized, the supervision highly centralized. And the legal department here at the parent um, monitors very, very carefully uh, any activity uh, that goes on in the subsidiaries in the legal matter. And indeed, they cannot move forward independently without clearing it for the parent. As so far as the actual substance, that is to say news gathering or what goes out over the air, we're very much concerned with quality and accuracy. And all of our editors and all of our te television station managers and so on are very alert to the fact that we do not like to be surprised by a Janet Cook kind of uh, thing. And uh, although the reporters, a great, great believer in freedom and, and, and to, the, to the extent that that's possible, but reporters are not free to uh, conceive a story that's not based on the facts. And if any of that sort of thing happens, it, it, there's no argument about what happens to that individual. So there are policies, even in the news gathering and in the editorial and the writing function, of accuracy, uh, certainly accuracy, uh, and to the extent possible, no subjective input, except, of course, on the editorial pages. So there are guidelines, written as well as sort of common law practice. To control our operation here at TI, we depend largely on individuals, the leadership of the individual managers, them making decisions that control what they're doing. In the area of quality control, we have the classical quality control organization that's separate from the manufacturing operation. The role of quality control is to document our rejects, our deviations from our standard specification. The role of the individual manager is to improve his product. So the, the pressure to improve quality is the role of the operations manager. And quality then performs a service of measuring the attainment of that goal. The measures are documented on the computer, tracked on the computer, uh, hundreds of parameters are tracked simultaneously on the computer so that a manager like myself can study his quality trends in a matter of 30 minutes and look at hundreds of parameters and problems will become immediately obvious by looking at the indices and trends. In terms of inventory, we build product. In terms of inventory control, we manufacture the high technology portion of product here in Dallas. 
We might do the assembly of that product in Malaysia. That product might be shipped to England and then from there to an individual customer. We build literally hundreds of thousands of device types. So in order to be able to tell a customer when he asks you the question, when can I have my part? I've got to know where that part is, anywhere in this worldwide organization. So Texas Instruments is the largest user of satellite communications tied back to commu computers. And we use those principally to control our inventory. Quality control system at Conrad primarily uh, consists of uh, detect and divert uh, system, probably not unlike most uh, other companies that use the same principle. Uh, that process consists of uh, your normal inspection processes based on AQL levels. Uh, from there, it's, it's a matter of uh, finding nonconformances, which is the detection uh, part, and diverting, of course, is preventing from the nonconformance problems to appear in products. Uh, from there, perhaps Conrack, uh, or the Conrack quality control system, differs quite dramatically, I think, than most other companies in that uh, we take it one step further and that uh, we very carefully, and I might say also sophistic very sophisticatedly, uh, take a look at the data and uh, analyze the data uh, through a microprocessor data acquisition system. And uh, the next step uh, is the most, probably the most important step, and that's uh, trying to uh, formalize or, or decide what, a, what exactly is the proper corrective action. And not only uh, to come up with just uh, temporary fixes, as you might say, but to uh, think a lot, lot more in long term uh, and find a, a solution that's going to correct the problem, not only for now, but uh, a year or two years from now. So that in essence, what you want to happen is for that problem never to reoccur again under any circumstances. Many times a problem can be corrected uh, only to reoccur two or three months later because you took a shortcut. And uh, that probably is the most the key part, most key element in a success, successful quality control. Control systems are vital aspects of any business. But if they're not carefully thought out, they can be very costly in terms of both time and money. For this reason, deciding what types of controls or control system to apply to any given situation is extremely important. One basic consideration is whether inspections, tests, or evaluations should be conducted continually on every item or on a sampling basis. In fields like space exploration, in which safety and precision are critical, virtually every item that's produced must be subjected to close control measures. In the production of most other products, it's neither necessary nor economically feasible to inspect every item. In still other areas, it's only possible to test parts and designs after the product has been assembled. When the Columbia Space Shuttle was first uh, tested, they found a problem that uh, they had not anticipated. Uh, on re-entry, there were several heat-resistant tiles that would shield the belly of the aircraft and would tend to diffuse some of the heat so that uh, the spacecraft would not melt or, or uh, uh, have any other distortions internally because of high heat. During the test run, they found that several of the tiles were falling off. Now, they had not anticipated that, and their first response was to try to come up with some kind of adhesion that would withstand the heat. And uh, they tried that, and they had some moderate success, but it wasn't as successful as, uh, as they had hoped. However, there was a discovery that was made. Even with the margin of error that they had not had anticipated, the ship maintained its integrity. Uh, they then tried to rework their thinking to see what would be the threshold for level of integrity. We'll continue to try to solve the, the tile problem, but we have something we had not anticipated before. To me, that's a classical example of a good control system. It should be noted that organizations apply control systems to personnel as well as to mechanical processes. Executives, managers, supervisors, and workers are all monitored, evaluated, and given feedback about the way they do their job. If the control system supplies accurate information, 
is timely and cost-effective, it can be an invaluable tool in any organization. The purpose of a performance appraisal is to give feedback to the employee on how he or she has performed during that period of time, and then most importantly, what to do about improvement and development and growth and future contributions to the organization. So any organization that thinks that performance appraisals are useless is, is making a serious error in not using a uh, fairly well-defined approach to improving people in the organization and their contributions. And I'm not suggesting it has to be organized in a bureaucratic and mechanical form. In fact, the less mechanical it is, uh, the better off it is, the better the communication between the, the two parties, the supervisor and the employee. But it is an important aspect of the human relations function to design those programs and then to put them into effect and to ensure by monitoring, measuring, and evaluating that they're doing what they were designed and intended to do. The goal of any control system is to make a positive contribution to an organization. An effective control system can make an organization both efficient and productive. By the same token, a faulty control system can inhibit the success of an organization. Many experts attribute the nuclear accident at the Three Mile Island electric plant to human error influenced by a faulty control system. The control system supplied the operators with inaccurate temperature information, giving them a distorted picture of what was actually happening in a critical area of the reactor. While a lack of proper controls can cause the collapse of an organization, good control systems have been the road back to success for many companies. For example, the bus division of Greyhound Corporation. Now, while the other divisions of the company enjoyed strong growth from the mid-60s to the mid-70s, the bus line, the original business of the corporation, began to go on the skids. As one senior executive put it, things had gotten to the point that hardly anybody at the top could tell what the hell was going on out on the line. So in early 1978, shocked by the deluge of customer complaints, Gerald H. Troutman, Greyhound's chief executive officer, hired his own team of 15 investigators, sent them out undercover to gather information on the problem using questions, checklists. The investigators covered the country making covert inquiries. The Troutman himself inspected local stations and garages. And when the final picture was in, it wasn't very good. In addition to changing personnel, decentralizing authority, and working to shore up morale, Troutman instituted a series of measures to ensure quality of service. That is, he instituted a new quality control system. He beefed up security at terminals. He enlarged weekend crews. He decentralized the maintenance operations. Each move was supported by a system of new checks and standards to achieve the new goals of higher quality service. As a result, the weekend out-of-commission rate was cut in half, and the average distance between breakdowns was increased from 125,000 miles to 165,000 miles. These achievements became the new standard. Along with other changes, the new controls were responsible for a 10% growth in passenger traffic, and this increase, along with an 18% fare increase, resulted in an 83% jump in revenue in 1979. And all of this was accomplished in a little over one year. One of the most dramatic developments in control systems has been the introduction of the computer and mathematical modeling. Modeling is the formulation of mathematical equations that managers can use in planning. The data that these models generate can help executives make forecasts. The strength of mathematical models is that they can show a series of results based upon a wide range of variables and a large database. These variables can be given any quantified value within a range that management thinks probable. The equations are then run through a computer to see what happens when the variables interact. So instead of relying on hunches, managers have a range of possible outcomes. Planners and decision makers 
can see the impact of various alternatives much more precisely. And indeed, this suggests something about the nature of management control systems nowadays, uh, and that is that whereas in the past, uh, management control systems tended to be somewhat backward-looking, perhaps due to the fact they were based on accounting information and accounting controls with their historical emphasis. We've started to look forward far more. And indeed, people other than accountants have become involved in the act. And therefore, we see many of the innovations of financial planning and control coming from corporate planners and from economists and from those who formerly would not have been thought of as the traditional control system designers. The acceptance of computers and the use of predictive mathematical models has, over the past decade, become a fact of life for many corporations. The key to this trend is the ability of the computer to process large amounts of control information. Uh, as corporations have become increasingly complex, uh, the amount of data necessary uh, to comprehend what's going on and to determine whether performance is meeting objectives or not has become larger and larger. Uh, and the use of a computer to organize that data has become more and more necessary. Uh, once again, though, as with a non-computer-based control system, for it to be effective, it has to be a system which is first directed upon a realistic and effective plan, financial plan or non-financial plan, so that any measurements of deviations from the plan are meaningful. There are a number of factors that must be taken into consideration in designing a control system. Does the organization understand the purpose and intended use of the system? Is the control designed to provide significant rather than trivial measurements? Is the control system accurate? Does it give managers information upon which to act within a reasonable time frame? Undoubtedly, there will be new devices and new developments in the control systems of the future. However, the basis upon which they're established will remain the same. The function of control and management is to keep the organization on the right track by checking performance against established standards. And it's this monitoring of activities that allows a company like this one to achieve its objectives. <laughs>